Italy's devastating earthquake. At least 37 are dead, hundreds more are missing. A whole village is razed to the ground. Also this lunchtime, the young British backpacker murdered in Australia. Police suspect terrorism could be a motive. It is alleged that the suspect used the phrase Allah Akbar during the attack and when arrested by police. Clogging the oceans and harming fish to keep your skin fresh. MPs call for a clampdown on microplastic beads in soaps and gels. And back from the emotion of Olympic triumph, Britain's brilliant gold medal boxer Nicola Adams joins me live. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Alistair Stewart. Good afternoon. Early this morning, a powerful earthquake struck at the heart of Italy's mountainous spine. 37 are confirmed dead, but with 150 still missing, the death toll will almost certainly rise. The quake, with a magnitude of 6.2 on the Richter scale, struck about 65 miles northeast of Rome. Amatice has been partly flattened, as has Akumoli, where a family of four are feared dead. Two young boys were rescued. They had hidden under a bed. The Italian Prime Minister said no family, no city, no hamlet will be left alone, and the Pope offered his prayers. Paul Davis reports. A scene of utter devastation. Residents joining rescue workers in the battle to save neighbours who disappeared beneath their collapsing homes early this morning. There have been some moments of hope. Here, a woman brought out alive from the rubble. But the number of dead has been rising steadily for some hours now. This is the mountain town of Amatrice, or what is left of it after the earthquake struck and ripped apart a community, preparing for its busiest time of year. I thank God I survived, this man says, but there were so many young people here. It's holiday season and the town fair the day after tomorrow. So many people had come for that. Not even Amatrice's Catholic church, built many centuries ago, had been spared. We are living through an immense tragedy, the parish priest said. It was a similar picture of devastation in the Umbrian town of Akumali. Several hours after the last aftershocks, rescue teams were still searching for families missing beneath the rubble. It was so scary, said this survivor. A huge tremor, everything was moving. Then there was no light and we were buried. This woman's ordeal lasted several hours. The rescue worker is telling her to remain calm and she is talking back. She was later brought out alive. Throughout the morning, they have been finding life where it seemed highly unlikely that any creature could survive. There have been multiple rescues of local residents and tourists, but rescue teams here bringing out another survivor are aware there are many others not so fortunate yet to be recovered. Paul Davis, ITV News. A British backpacker has been stabbed to death in a hostel in Australia. 21-year-old Mia Aycliffe Chung, who's originally from Derbyshire, had apparently just moved to Townsville on the east coast of the country to work. The suspect, who is French, is alleged to have said the Arabic phrase Aloha Akbar, meaning God is greatest, during the attack. A British man was also injured. Social Carrier has more. Mia Eilif Chung was on a trip of a lifetime, backpacking round Australia. <laughs> Friends described the 21-year-old from Derbyshire as an infectiously happy girl. But last night she was killed in her hostel, stabbed to death in front of 30 onlookers. It's claimed her alleged attacker, a 29-year-old French national, shouted Allahu Akbar, God is great. Police are investigating whether his motives were terror related. Initial inquiries indicate that comments may be construed of an extremist nature were made by the alleged offender. It is alleged that the suspect used the phrase Allah Akbar during the attack and when arrested by police. Whilst this information will be factored into the investigation, 
We are not ruling out any motivations at this early stage, whether they be, be, be political or criminal. Mia was attacked in a popular backpacking town in Queensland on Australia's east coast. She'd started her trip in Sydney six months earlier, arriving in Townsville ten days ago to begin work fruit picking. Police say her attacker had been in the country since March on a temporary visa and had no known local connections. A British man was also severely injured and remains critical in hospital. Speaking to ITV News, the local mayor said that backpackers have always been treated part of the community. People are in shock and sad and it's a safe place and it's a welcoming place. You know, we welcome all the, all the backpackers, all the tourists who come. Mia had been sharing her experiences of her Australian adventure on Facebook. One of her last, posted less than a week ago, was about the wildlife she'd seen and how she was topping up her tan. A young woman who friends said oozed life, one that's now been brutally taken away. Sejal Karia, ITV News. And our correspondent Ben Chapman joins me live now from Derbyshire, where Mia's family is from. Uh, any reaction there from anybody who, who knew Mia, Ben? Yes, I've been speaking to a friend of Mia's mum in the last few hours and she described uh, her mum as being distraught after hearing the news at about 11 o'clock last night from two police officers that her only child had been murdered out in Australia. The friend knew Mia quite well, uh, had known her quite well while she was growing up. She'd been travelling for about a year but had only been staying in Queensland relatively recently, we understand. She hadn't seen her mum in all the time she'd been away but had been in constant email contact with her and in fact had had an exchange with her mum just a few hours before her death, uh, I'm told. The friend described her as amazing, very savvy, a young woman who was really happy travelling, making her way around the world. We've also heard from a teacher at her old school this morning who described her as a bubbly student who was energetic, caring and who immersed herself in life. Ben, thank you. Some breaking news that we're just hearing this lunchtime and a serving member of the British Armed Forces has been arrested on suspicion of Northern Ireland-related terrorism offences. Well, our security editor, Rohit Katru, joins me live in the studio literally the last few minutes or so. What have you been able to find out? Well, the details, Alistair, as you say, is still very sketchy. This arrest happened little more than an hour ago. Uh, but perhaps most significant is the fact that this 30-year-old man who was arrested is a serving member uh, of the British Armed Forces. This arrest happened in Somerset and we're told uh, that a house is currently being searched uh, in South Devon and, importantly, uh, to note that this was uh, a result of an intelligence-led operation. This wasn't uh, something that uh, investigators ra uh, randomly uh, stumbled across. Uh, the terror threat to the uh, British mainland in the last few months has been raised to the... Uh, speci that specific measure has been raised to substantial. And, of course, Northern Irish terrorism, the threat there within the province, uh, is judged to be at a substantial risk. All right, Rohit, more, I'm sure, by 6.30. Thank you very much. Turkish tanks have entered Syria as part of a major assault on so-called Islamic State and Syrian Kurdish fighters. Special forces and jets supported by US-led coalition launched the operation in northern Syria. The Syrian foreign ministry has condemned the actions of Turkey as, and I quote, a breach of sovereignty. Here, police investigating the Hillsborough disaster have released images of 19 people who were at the stadium on the day of the disaster that they still want to speak to. New images from the Leppings Lane end of the football ground in Sheffield have been released showing the potential witnesses. A two-year-old girl who was swept out to sea with her family in Cornwall last week has died in hospital. Michaelia Bryanice's father, Rudy, was also killed when the family of five was caught by a 13-foot wave whilst on a beach in Newquay. And the world's largest aircraft, Airlander 10, has crashed during its second test flight in Bedfordshire. Manufacturer Hybrid Air Vehicles says no one was injured in the crash. 
Now, the Information Commissioner is looking at a possible breach of data protection rules after Virgin Trains released CCTV footage of Jeremy Corbyn, allegedly walking past empty seats on a train. You may recall the Labour leader had filmed himself sitting on the floor of a train complaining about overcrowding. Virgin, however, said there were spare seats on the service. Angus Walker joins us now from Westminster. Um, this rumbles on. I heard you talking about it to Mr Corbyn earlier this morning. Where are we now with this story? Well, you're right. This row over whether Jeremy Corbyn had a seat on a train or not seems to chug on, perhaps. And today, Jeremy Corbyn, rather reluctantly, at the launch of his NHS policies, was asked about it. It's developing into more of a spat between him and Richard Branson, the, ma the man behind Virgin Trains, and also the Information Commissioner getting involved as well. You may remember that this was uh, earlier this month. Jeremy Corbyn released a video of him sitting on the floor. He said forced to because the train he was on to Newcastle was so full. Then yes. Yesterday, Virgin Trains releasing CCTV, suggesting he'd walked past empty seats and then filmed his video sitting on the floor and then returned to a seat a bit later on. The Information Commissioner today saying it's making inquiries about release of that CCTV and said it must only be done on legitimate grounds by organisations. Virgin Trains saying they're happy to cooperate. Today at the press conference, Jeremy Corbyn had a chance to have a dig at Richard Branson himself. Well, I'm very pleased that Richard Branson has been able to break off from his holiday to take this issue seriously with the importance it obviously deserves. I hope he's very well aware of our policy, which is that um, train operating companies should become part of the public realm, not the private sector. And Mr Corbyn was not alone in having a dig, to use your word, uh, at his rival over his language. Yeah, Owen Smith appeared to suggest last night that Jeremy Corbyn was a lunatic. This morning he was forced to apologise, said he was actually talking about himself. The plot thickens, but he did promise to use less colourful language in the future. Angus, thank you. Still to come this lunchtime, a British boxing legend live in the studio. And how the success of Team GB is inspiring our Paralympians too. But first, MPs are calling for a ban on microplastic beads, a product you may not have heard of but probably use. They are the things that give the abrasive edge to face washes and shower gels. Well, the Environmental Audit Committee says 680 tonnes of the beads are used in the UK every year, with as many as 100,000 of them washed down the plug hole in a single shower. Well, the chair of the committee, Mary Cray, says that the tiny plastic balls are polluting the oceans and entering the marine and human food chains. What happens when these uh, plastics are consumed by uh, marine life is that they grow more slowly. So there are economic impacts for the uh, UK shellfish uh, industry as well. If you've had a plate of six oysters, you'll have eaten up to 50 mi particles of microplastics. And that's not something that most of us like to w would really uh, enjoy thinking about. So that's Mary Cray's version of what the problem is. Our consumer editor, Chris Troy, is off the coast of Southampton to explain what damage those tiny particles really do. Well, from those toiletries and cosmetics that may contain these microbeads in your home, they can be washed down the plug hole in your bathroom and next step virtually can be here, out of at sea. And to pick up the story of what happens next, I'm joined by Dr. Simon Boxall from the University of Southampton. Many people will use these products routinely, but never have actually seen one of these microbeads. They will, and they're in lots of different products. And here we get some ex an example of them. These are quite coarse ones, but these are very small particles that are sort of manufactured to be a very precise shape and size, which makes it easy when you're producing large quantities of cosmetics or toothpaste or whatever. The problem is that the sewage treatment works can't filter these out, and so they find their way into the ocean. Now, the big question is, does that cause a problem? It causes two problems. First of all, the microscopic animals of the oceans see them as food, and rather than eating the phytoplankton, the small plants, they eat these instead, and they die. The other problem is that they're like sponges and they absorb toxins from the water itself and they concentrate those toxins. They're then ingested by things like shellfish, prawns, that sort of thing. So what um, we've seen, that they, they can enter the food chain. How far up can they get? Can they get to they our plates? They all the way to our plates. 
Now, I wouldn't recommend we stop eating seafood, it's really good for us, but in the long term we need to monitor this carefully and if we can avoid using them, there are plenty of alternatives, then it would be better to get rid of them altogether. What kind of alternatives? Things like crushed shells, sand, you know, um, natural things that go into the oceans that are naturally either break down or they're part of the makeup of the oceans in the first place. The problem with the plastics is they can take 50 or 100 years to break down. So we've got all the microbeads produced so far that are still out there somewhere. And normally on a beautiful day like today where you've got intense sun, you'd get plastics breaking down. But th this is not happening with this the microbeads. And it won't happen with most plastics. They break down to smaller particles but the plastics are still in the oceans and they take hundreds of years. Simon, thank you very much indeed for joining us on the boat. Well, we spoke to the industry. They say that they're phasing out these microbeads. They'll be gone from these products by 2020 and some individual firms are moving faster than that. The story here is that something that starts as cosmetic in our lives ends up as a contaminant out here at sea. Chris Choi on a boat for us this lunchtime. Now, when Team GB disembarked from their celebratory flight back from Rio, one of the first faces we all saw was Olympic boxing champion Nicola Adams, who repeated her London success and now has two gold medals. In fact, she's the first British boxer to do that in more than 90 years, and I couldn't be more chuffed to say that she's sitting next to me right now. Warmest congrats. When you walked into the newsroom upstairs, the producer just told me you got a big round of applause. Yeah, I did. I got a big round of applause. Everybody was wanting selfies as well. So it was it was really nice, really good welcome. Should we keep the secret that I asked you for one as well when you sat down just before? <laughs> 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 now, I got one complaint. Why only one gold medal? Oh, because I haven't been home yet. I literally got off of the plane yesterday and I've been here um, doing, a, doing, a lot, doing a lot of work, a lot of media and a lot of news, letting everybody know what it, was, what it was like winning two gold medals. One of the heavyweight things that you said before you set off to defend that title was, and I quote, I want to stop people saying she's a good female boxer. I only want to hear she's a good boxer. Job done? Yeah, I think uh, the job's done with that, this little, this little beauty here. Double Olympic champion. The other thing we were talking about upstairs is, is what happens next, because I asked you that point about job done in terms of not making the gender distinction. You're a boxer, you're a boxer. But if you were a lad, you'd be looking forward to making millions. That's not necessarily the case for women. In fact, there have been very, very few who've made money out of it as well. Yeah, um, the, but the pros is a is an option as well. Um, it is quite big in big in the states, and who knows? Maybe maybe someone needs to uh, break the barriers over here and make it make it a big thing. Are you talking to people about that? Well, for me at the moment, I'm just going on a going on a holiday, and I'm going to relax, relive uh, this nice little gold medal for a little bit before I I make any any uh, decisions about what I'm going to do next. But as an athlete as well, you're absolutely determined that it is still boxing. It's not the sort of, you don't want to go into the, the, the mixed martial arts, which I know women in America, again, particularly make a lot of money out of that. For you, boxing is the sport. Pugilism at its purest. Yeah, I, I, I love, uh, love the boxing. Um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure how good uh, my groundwork would be on the mixed martial arts. I might, I might have to tap out. <laughs> so you put the fear of God into the French woman. You won for the second time. Weepies on the podium. Was that about the flag, the moment, the anthem? Um, I think it was a bit of everything for, for me, to be honest. Um, the emotion of working so hard for, for four years, um, the shoulder operations, the injuries, and all the challenges that I had to face, and just come, being able to come back from that and stand on the podium and think, I'm, I'm Olympic champion, I've done it, I'm a double gold medalist, and I, I, was just, I was just so happy. We're so proud, it's brilliant. Are you still scared of spiders? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, spiders are the only things that are safe. Nicola, it's been a real pleasure to see you again. Thank Warmest you. congratulations. Brilliant. Uh, right, now I got all <laughs> flustered about that. Great joy, great honour. Now, after the return of the Triumph and Team GB, our Paralympic athletes are preparing for their moment in the sun in Rio. Multiple medal winner David Weir has been training this morning. He has already won six golds in past games and will be hoping to build on that remarkable tally in two weeks' time. Our sports correspondent Ian Payne is with him in South Wales, right, southwest London right now. So the success, Ian, of our returning athletes, perhaps inspiring David and the others? 
Well, let's ask him. Delighted to be joined by David Weir. Multiple gold medalists, as you say, in the Paralympics. Been going since 1996. That seems like a long time ago now. Have you been inspired by what you've been seeing in Rio? Yeah, definitely. You know, seeing the, the Team GB uh, win all their medals has definitely inspired me in the last couple of weeks to hopefully go out there and do the same job. What keeps you going? As I say, you've been doing this since 1996. Uh, winning, mate. Um, <laughs> that's that's the, the answer, you know, and, and in London to win four gold medals was absolutely special. And uh, it's been hard, you know, for the next four years to try and get in that sort of shape. But this year, I, I don't know, something just clicked in my head and uh, training's been going well. And, uh, you know, everyone around me, my team around me are telling me that you know, I'm faster and quicker and fitter than I was uh, for 2012. So it's all looking good. Yeah, so in 2012 there, we see you winning the marathon in London. This time, you, you change the events, but you're still doing so many. 400, 800, 1500, marathon, relay. Where would you get the stamina from? All the mileage I do in Richmond Park, to be honest, and all the training I've done over the years and, uh, and all of the training I've done this year. And, uh, you know, a lot of people... I've said, oh, you're going to win five gold medals. To be honest, I just do these events just to, because I've got that opportunity maybe to win um, five gold medals. But if something goes wrong in the first event, I've got another opportunity to, to, win a, to, to win a gold. And what do you feel about the fact that Paralympic funding seems to have gone down a bit? They haven't sold that many tickets. Are you worried about being sort of second class citizens at all? To be honest, I've got to do the job um, to go and race, and, and that's what I've been preparing for. Um, yes, it will be a bit disappointing if. Some things are cut and, uh, you know, if there isn't crowd out there to, to support us, you know, superb athletes that we are. Um, yeah, I'll, you know, I've just got to go out there and, and do the best I can and, and that's what I'm, I'm been training for. Well, we wish you luck. Thank you for talking to us. And he's expecting, his partner anyway, another little one. Let's hope it's timed right. <laughs> Warmest congratulations, Ian. Thanks very much. A reminder of our main story this lunchtime, a strong earthquake has struck central Italy, killing at least 37 people, leaving dozens of others trapped under the rubble. The quake had a magnitude of 6.2. That's it. See you at 6.30. Bye-bye.